dialogue conspiracy. Political research specialist May Brussel, whose conspiracy newsletter appears in the Realist magazine, has for over two and a half years shared with KLRB listeners the fruits of her decades research into political assassinations and other abuses of power in America. Her weekly commentary on KLRB-FM is the most hard-hitting and comprehensive report of its kind in the country, relating as it does the news of the week to the evidence emerging about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains its power by force over America's electoral and executive processes. Dialogue Conspiracy, a unique talk show. It's the most up-to-date, well-documented, no-nonsense political analysis going. And it goes over KLRB FM 102 on Monday afternoons at 5.15. Good afternoon on Dialogue Conspiracy. October the 22nd, 1973. This is our 123rd hour, two and a half years on KLRB. And we welcome on board WAER in Syracuse, New York. We'll be covering Dialogue Conspiracy every week. For several years, the title of this program was called Dialogue Assassination because the bulk of my research is into the political assassinations taking place in the United States, starting with the assassination of President John Kennedy in Dallas, November 22, 1963. The remarks made on our broadcast are based upon research that began at that time. My conclusion has been for many, many years that the electoral process is determined in the United States by the bullets instead of the ballots. When the government was overthrown in Dallas, Texas in 1963, I realize that a conspiracy, if indeed it did take place, would affect many facets of our nation. The nation would be convulsed with wars, with murders, chaos, confusion, corruption, and an eventual open declared dictatorship, unless the conspirators were halted from the job that they had gone about and planned within the offices of Washington in the intelligence agencies and along with the military. The Watergate affair, which continues to take the news uh, by storm every week, was described by me July the 11th, 1972, in an article I did for The Realist. Three weeks after the arrest at the Watergate uh, Hotel in Washington, D.C., and in my mind, it was the most important event in the United States history since the invasion of Normandy the beachhead where the Nazis began to be turned back and the forces of evil at the time of World War II were contained. I felt that America was on the brink of fascism. I not only felt it, but so did James McCord, as he stated quite clearly his reasons for giving Judge Sirica information about the Watergate affair. America was becoming Nazified. The Constitution was to be eliminated. Sections of it already were being whittled away. The Bill of Rights would be taken away. And um, I was concerned about the laws that were being put into effect and are still being put into effect every day to get tighter control of the government. The Watergate affair broke open when James McCord wanted to tell the government what happened, and that was in March of 1973. The Justice Department up to that time failed to investigate the Watergate affair because they were part of the the planning and the cover-up. The Attorney General was involved, the Assistant Attorney General Robert Mardian, members of the FBI, and they did not intend to arrest the proper persons who planned and instigated not only the break-in to the Democratic headquarters, but the manipulation of the Democratic candidates for 1972. Congress sat on their hands, the radicals sat on their hands, the liberals did nothing, the conservatives did nothing, the very conservatives did nothing, Everybody sat silent and was perfectly satisfied to re-elect Richard Nixon in spite of the evidence that the election could have been put off. And seven people were going to go to jail, and that would be the end of the case. And for the most part, the entire nation was satisfied. But James McCord, who worked for the CIA and the federal government for 21 years, feared a Nazi Gestapo. He said we were having the same kind of a Gestapo that had a Nazi Germany. And in order to end or expose the fascist state, he sent a note to Judge Sirica, and he said he did not trust the Justice Department, the FBI, 
the criminal investigative department and that he wanted to tell what happened so that congress was forced not because they wanted to they could have done it before the elections they were forced to form a committee with archibald cox as a special investigator who went into two grand juries and was to investigate the watergate affair and the senate select committee was appointed to go into all the evidence of the election of 1972 and carefully examine just what happened that made Richard Nixon declare that he had a mandate in 1972. The uh, Archibald Cox went about his business. Uh, he had already made one indictment. That's all in all this time that Egil Crow. He was going to make more, but so far he's only made one. And many of the people that are involved are still out on the streets uh, yachting and uh, earning a living and going to Europe and having quite a luxurious time. The Senate Select Committee has been, in my mind, a cover-up ever since it started. In spite of themselves, certain things opened up. This, the Anthony Lassowitz, John Caulfield, uh, new witnesses, Mr. Butterfield, the tapes, all of those things came out, not because the Senate wanted to go into them. John Dean took from the office the enemy list, the intelligence plan inside the White House, now, Lewis Tackwood had mentioned that plan a year before at a press conference in Los Angeles, California, but the Senate Select Committee didn't want to know those things. And all the information that's coming out from the Watergate is coming in spite of themselves, not because the Senate is doing it, not because the Congress is doing it, but because certain people are talking. The Senate Select Committee has not gone into the planned killings or the violence for the convention that was to take place or the plans to kill Richard Nixon, the evidence that's available, or the foreknowledge that Martha Mitchell talked about, or the Lewis Tackwood plans, the San Diego plans. They're not going into William Sullivan, the FBI, Division 5, the liaison from the FBI to Robert Marty and the White House and the past political assassinations. Arthur Bremer's alive, and in May he shot George Wallace, giving Richard Nixon 26 million votes. Bremer's not called to see who paid for his bill at the Waldorf Astoria or in Canada or his liaison with the CIA in Canada. And Mr. Lasowitz has not been called back for his affair at Chappaquiddick and Mary Jo Kopechny and the relationship of Mr. Hunt and Colson to the Wallace shooting or to the Mary Jo Kopechny murder. That is what the Senate committee isn't going into. So while the Senate Select Committee was taking their recess this summer, another lawsuit was taking place in spite of the Senate, and this was out in California, where Robert Mayhew was suing Howard Hughes for $13 million. He had been fired from the Hughes empire. And in the course of the investigation out there, not because of the Senate and not because of Archibald Cox, some very shocking testimony came out about Howard Hughes funding Richard Nixon. Now, in the article I did in uh, 72 about how Richard Nixon came to power with aerospace and the money behind Richard Nixon and the used money and the pompous foundation behind um, this administration, the Senate. Again, the, the uh, investigating body don't even whisper any of this funding. But it was only the Mayhew testimony that came out, and we're going into it, and this is the testimony that I think brought down Archibald Cox and was the excuse to fold the office of the committee that Richard Nixon agreed upon would investigate the Watergate. Archibald Cox had subpoenaed Bibi Rebozo, and he wanted Mr. Albanap, and he wanted Howard Hughes be, to find out about the funding based upon the testimony we'll go into in a minute. Um, as a way out, Richard Nixon gave Mr. Cox an unreasonable solution to the tapes against the court orders or against what he agreed to do. And Archibald Cox was forced with only one answer. That's not good enough. You can't select sections of those controversial White House tapes. That's not good enough. And then Richard Nixon could respond and say, then you're fired. As soon as Archibald Cox was fired, he didn't just fire the man. In came the federal marshals, the FBI, the Pentagon, and they removed from the offices all the investigative work that the Special Prosecuting Committee had been doing since May. Now, that, the marshals coming in, the, the Justice Department objected to them, discharged them, I, I believe today, wanted some other people guarding the paper, and there has been mentioned that Mr. Cox and others are afraid that the evidence in the hands of the Justice Department and the White House will be destroyed now, shredded, burned, dumped, like the massive evidence that was 
collected after the arrest at the Watergate or before some of the men were indicted or arrested. Now, Mr. Cox, by saying, I'm not going to give you the tapes, that was the excuse for the marshals to end the investigations completely. But this is the problem in Washington now, and I'll go, as I say, into the evidence. Richard Nixon is expendable. He's only a man, a front man. It doesn't matter if he's impeached. People are wiring to Washington. They're calling to Washington, impeach Richard Nixon. But Richard Nixon is owned. He was going to be killed anyway between the nomination and the election. The evidence is massive, and the committee won't go into it, you see. Richard Nixon is a man. And you're talking about a warfare state. After I've studied Dallas and I study Vietnam and the war conspiracy and warfare states, this is a warfare state where a handful of corporates and the two top ones are Howard Hughes and ITT, own the White House. And Nixon is expendable, but Hughes isn't going to be investigated, and neither is Bibi Rebozo or the chain of command of the Bahamas or that group of Nazis down there that tie up to Division 5, where uh, during this interim, too, Senator Weicker was interviewing uh, Mr. Sullivan of Division 5, and Sullivan was beginning to talk about Robert Mardian and give information. This is the can of worms that Washington can't handle. So while all of you are sending your wires, impeach Nixon. Nixon is expendable. Agnew is expendable. Roy Ash stays at the Office of Management Budget. He holds all the money that Congress has. He determines whether we have money for the blind, the lame, for mental health, for people on the streets, uh, pregnant mothers, daycare centers, every domestic bill is tied up in the hands of Roy Ash of Lytton Industries, the same group that overthrew Greece and put in a military dictatorship. It would be better to say impeach Roy Ash because Richard Nixon only takes orders for the National Security Council. But if he is moved out, the team still stays intact. That's the point. The team that, that manipulates the power on a chessboard, and we're going into that. Uh, they have a game board, devised, games devised up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And these war games like taking over Chile or Camelot, destroying the whole last 10 years of John Kennedy, turn out not to be just coincidental chains of events, but they're planned. And the main people are acted out how they react to different situations. And I feel very strongly that the move in Washington is in order to fold up the offices. Now, President Nixon said very clearly that he would not abide by a 5-2 to two vote by the U.S. Court of Appeals. And this is what he said. To my regret, the special prosecutor has rejected this proposal to have Senator John Stennis listen to the requested tapes and verify the statements. Though I have not wished to intrude upon the independence of the special prosecutor, I have felt it necessary to direct him as an employee of the executive branch to make no further attempt by the judicial process to obtain tapes, notes, memoranda, or presidential conversations. The government must re remain strong and effective, and what matters most in this critical hour is our ability to act in a way that enables us to control events, not to be paralyzed or overwhelmed by them. At home, the Watergate issue has taken overtones of a partisan political contest. Concurrently, there are those in the international community who have trouble uh, with the difficulties at home and misread America's unity and resolve in meeting that challenge that we confront abroad. And I've concluded that I must take decisive action that will avoid a constitutional crisis and lay the groundwork upon which to assure a unity of purpose at home. It is not in the national interest to leave this matter unresolved for a period required by the highest court. Translated, it means this. Number one, the prosecutors are not to bother with any evidence that the president is involved in criminal conduct in the White House. Number two, it is his ability to act in a way to control events. In other words, the FBI, the CIA, the Pentagon, the Justice Department, all that were involved in the Watergate will control events. It's not for them to give themselves away and let Mr. Cox investigate any further this chain of command or this can of worms that involves the Vegas, Bahamas, Miami, International, uh, goes to Nicaragua, Costa Rica, the Hughes, Rebozo, Nixon connection. In the third place, he says Watergate has become political, and he doesn't want this to become a partisan political contest. 
if you go over the evidence and the testimony since the very first person was arrested, it was the Democratic Party that was sabotaged. It was the Democratic documents that were forged. It was a Democratic president who was defamed when he was dead and accused of being a murderer. It was Democratic Party where that was turned against each other as enemies against each other. It was a Democratic Party that was infiltrated, and their schedules were known in advance. They were embarrassed upon arrival. They were associated with communists and radicals. They were blackmailed with women and acid and public exposure. There was an attempted assassination upon a candidate on the eve of his primaries, and there was the murder of Mary Jo Kopechny to take Ted Kennedy off the nomination. All of this was done to the Democratic Party, and Richard Nixon says the Watergate issue has the overtone of partisan political contest. There is not one iota of a Democratic spy in the entire event, and Richard Nixon's using the excuse of international crisis. Earl Warren cried when and Lyndon Johnson brought him in and told him to head the Warren Commission. He cried like a baby. He didn't want to take it. It was going to be a fictitious, lying document where there wasn't a sentence of truth hardly in the whole book. And they were going to pervert the witness testimony, select special witnesses, eliminate key ones, eliminate evidence that proved a conspiracy in Dallas. And Earl Warren took it. And the, the plea was it was in national interest. The government couldn't stand the truth. And Richard Nixon is using the same fib now. Now, what was the turn of event during the summer recess of the Senate Watergate Committee that caused Senator Baker under uh, confusion to say, well, this is a new can of worms if this is true? Robert Mayhew, under oath on July 4th, 1973, that's a good day, our Independence Day, July the 4th, said this. This was in Los Angeles. And you, if you want to look this up, Washington Post, October the 7th, 1973. Robert Mayhew talked about a meeting in 1967 at the Hughes Tool Company where Howard Hughes, he has a written memorandum from Howard Hughes where Hughes was asking to make a million-dollar payoff for the President of the United States. This was in 1967. That was just before Robert Kennedy was killed, and Sirhan Sirhan had links with the racetrack group down at Del Mar. He was heavily involved with the operatives that created this conspiracy or the illusion that Sirhan had killed Robert Kennedy. He was a patsy, and he was hardly, there were a lot of people paid off. And Sirhan, I don't know how much money he ever got out of this, but all of this operation of Sirhan, the conspiracy part, involved the racetracks down at San Diego. But in 1967, Howard Hughes offered a million dollars for a president of the United States. He taught, the two aides that are talking about this now are Mr. Noah Dietrich, who 32 years worked with Hughes as his chief executive. He's an ex-FBI man. And Robert Mayhew, who ran the Nevada operations. In 1968, when, after Robert Kennedy was murdered, $25,000 was sent to Larry O'Brien. Howard Hughes became a, giving donations to the Democratic Party after Robert Kennedy was dead. He felt it was proper, he said, to meet his commitment. So 25000 went to Larry O'Brien. Mayhew went to O'Brien because of instructions of Pierre Salinger, and money was paid. He gave $50,000 that you've been writing about. Howard used to Mayhew, and Richard Nixon asked that this be delivered to his friend B.B. Rebozo. So $50,000 went to B.B. Rebozo down at Key Biscayne, and another $50,000 went to B. Rebozo at San Clemente. This $100,000 that was cash that was delivered to Richard Nixon came at a time when Richard Nixon needed $100,000 cash to pay for his home at San Clemente, just exactly the same dates. It also came at a time in 1969, the first 50000 came when Howard Hughes wanted to acquire Air West and delivered the money to B. B. Rebozo and there was a Justice Department decision on whether he should have Air West. And in 1970, another 50000 was delivered after three meetings with Attorney General John Mitchell that reversed the antitrust division and the opposition to Howard Hughes acquiring one more Nevada gambling casino. Now, uh, Mayer went on to say that uh, not only did Howard Hughes fund Richard Nixon, this particular 100000 cash, and he offered a million dollars for a president of the United States, but as soon as Robert Kennedy was killed, he heavily financed the 1968 elections and all the candidates down the line and said, 
I think we can uh, we have a good candidate now to uh, get into effect the things that we want. In uh, regarding the Bahamas, Robert Mayo testified that Howard Hughes said, and he has memos that he wanted to wrap up that government down there to the point where we will have a captive enemy entity in every way. This was a memo of Mayus regarding Howard Hughes. We wrap up that government to the point where we'll have a captive entity in every way. That reminds me of the news breaking up now in uh, investigations in Washington of Elliot Roosevelt, who has been named as one of the men who made a part payment allegedly uh, for the assassination plans to kill the prime minister of the Bahamas, Lyndon Pinley, because he promised to open can't gambling syndicates down in the Bahamas and uh, he didn't go ahead with it. So there was an offer to kill him. That's how you wrap up a government in every way. You get your financial investment back or the heads of governments or murdered. It's just that simple. I can cite it over and over again. Mayhew's testimony said in 1970, the year that uh, used dispense with hundreds of thousands of dollars to politicians on specific instructions. He was giving Mayhew specific instructions. In mid-1970, he said to use, I want to own the president. At a meeting in mid-70, Hughes was worried about this statement. And the, the remarks that he made, Howard Hughes said, I want to own the president. Hughes wanted to exercise power, particularly since he was involved in national defense. And this came out in the testimony in Los Angeles. During 1940 and 1950, Howard Hughes didn't give that much money to political campaigns. It was only after 1960, after John Kennedy was killed, that it was important to get the government back into the control of the aerospace and the warfare manufacturers. And in addition to my cross-following the documents on the Kennedy assassination, the chain of command becomes more clear all the time. Hughes was very close to Lyndon Johnson, and he, he had a conduit of millions of dollars of political money pouring through Frank J. Adders, an L.A. lawyer. You said he wanted to own Nevada. He gave thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to the governor, the, the lieutenant governor, the Supreme Court Justice, the assistant attorney general, the legislative candidates, the junior senator, the Democratic senator. I have a list here of hundreds of thousands of dollars. He said he wanted to own the government. He gave money to men like Peter Pitches in Los Angeles, the sheriff's department. It was Pitch's operation that, that did the government uh, bombing of the Bank of America at Isla Vista, the Sharon Tate massacre, which was an Army intelligence operation done through Sheriff Pitch's office, through the Sheriff's office in Los Angeles, California. Those were provocateur operations that were concealed by the government and planned by the government. Uh, a public relations firm, Carl Beyer in Los Angeles, was the conduit of the political funds that Howard Hughes has been dishing out. Lyndon Johnson has gotten $5,000 every year he got for many years. One of the important clues to Howard Hughes' money when he first started financing his campaigns, he was told to go to, for, to Canada for political contributions and then send it to America, and it wouldn't be discovered if he gave corporations weren't supposed to give to politicians, particularly running for president, but to politicians. So he was advised, according to me, if you go to Canada, then you can bring the money back in through the corporations into America. And may you reveal the exposure of money from use in Canada to the Bank of America in Hollywood, uh, Hollywood, California, in West Hollywood. And that's important because use, I have felt, has owned Richard Nixon or a piece of Nixon since he was in Navy intelligence. And I wrote about that, how Richard Nixon really came to power in my first article in The Realist, The Aerospace and the Call from Bank of America Vice President of the Bank of America, when he was unknown in California or anywhere else, and he was still in Long Island. And this fits in with my research, the Mayu testimony of the funding of used money to West Hollywood, to the Bank of America, because the secret Lincoln Club and the funding of Richard Nixon came from Southern California, but now we have conduit of Canadian money coming to the Bank of America, and we know for sure that the Bank of America was behind Richard Nixon. The used Nixon loans. Um, everybody, most people are familiar with the Donald Nixon in 1956 that nobody knows was paid back or not. Uh, the relationship of Donald Nixon to the Dominican Republic and his being wired to after bugged by the Secret Service Technical Security Division. Uh, Richard Nixon was bugging his own brother and his brother had 
strong connections with Howard Hughes. Now, it is my opinion, as people analyze the news, and they're doing it, and they're calling the House, and people want my opinion about the firing of Archibald Cox and the retirement of the Elliot Richardson or Mr. Russell House. And I feel that the whole thing was maneuvered, in, that Mr. Cox was in a position that he couldn't take a bargain or a deal like that as the special investigator, and the whole position was done to stop the investigation of the Richard Nixon, Howard Hughes, Robert Mayhew links, and going on down, as I say, to Miami, the Bahamas, and all around the Caribbean, and they're international. But they couldn't afford for this to go on, so the marshals came in, and they can take away the, all, all the material. Because it'll be a, a shock to me if the special investigator, whoever he's employed, whoever he's employed, gets heavily into the Rebozo connections or the Richard Nixon funding of his house. You see, they were going too far. Cox was hired to find out who wired after who knew about it in advance. But as the news broke, and they were going to Richard Nixon's home, who bought the home? Does he pay taxes? How much cash does he have? Do they report it? When you go into this, you know how the White House is bought, and you reveal the whole chain of command, and then that means new laws. The Congress is working now on new election laws, but if they break open the whole National Security Council and the Central Intelligence Agency and the intelligence agencies working with the Pentagon, they may be able to clean them out. So it was very important, in my mind, for the marshals to come in now and grab up this stuff because already Rebozo had been called and uh, Mr. Cox wanted Howard Hughes, which we know is an impossibility. And all Hughes has to do is give the orders and they can clean out all the offices and It'll be a long time before they get back into investigating those subjects. I predict it will be a long time. I'll be very shocked if they ever get back to those. Now, we have to do a little bit today on the nominated vice president. I did some things last week because the news had just come in about Gerald Ford, Richard Nixon's choice as vice president of the United States. It's interesting. I said for many, many years that John Conley was walking around with a bullet in him it wasn't removed for surgical reasons, I suppose, at the time that John Kennedy was killed, John Conley was sitting in the car. He didn't expect to be shot. Excellent marksman with a crossfire from three different directions, shot simultaneously as an umbrella man. Uh, we have his name, gave a signal, lowered the umbrella, and the crossfire went off. John Conley was certainly a part of the cover-up of the entire Kennedy conspiracy, and I always felt that the bullet that he had was his guarantee that he would get the nomination of presidency someday in exchange for his knowing what he knew and being part of the team. He's a good team member. So it was interesting in the Washington Post this week in an article by Carol Kirkpatrick talking about the nomination of Gerald Ford, and they explained how Conley sidetracked uh, this appointment now because later he wants to be president. He doesn't want to come in as a vice president. This is a quotation from the Washington Post. Conley dodged a bullet. One person fully informed as to Conley's thinking said yesterday, by do dodging a bullet now, he remains a formidable potential candidate for president in 76 without having gone through a wounding confirmation flight. fight. I thought that was interesting that a fully informed individual who knows Conley's thinking said that at, by dodging a bullet, he remains a formidable potential candidate in 76. I know uh, that he is a good candidate competing with Ronald Reagan in California, or maybe both of them will take the honors side by side, but he has that bullet in him, and John Conley knows too much about Dallas for them to push him aside at this point and not let him have the nomination. Gerald Ford, uh, we went into last week at length. I take eight papers a day. The New York Times, the Washington Post are filled with articles about Gerald Ford. The newspapers are scraping up everything about his biography. But it's very interesting to me that nobody mentions that he was on the Warren Commission. Now, this is shocking to me because the radio talk shows have brought it up. But I haven't seen in print that Gerald Ford was on the Warren Commission, that controversial document. 109 books have been written about the John Kennedy assassination. The evidence is overwhelming at this point. There was a conspiracy, and Gerald Ford isn't even mentioned as being a member of that fictitious committee just to show the kind of work he does. Gerald Ford fits the National Security Council profile. Every time we have an assassination, like the alleged uh, 
Assass and Lee Harvey Oswald or Bram or Sirhan Sirhan or James Ray, the CIA comes out with their profile of what assassin would be like, not based on the bullets or the weapons, but their mentality of what an assassin is. So I have done my profile, equivalent to the CIA profile, of what a good vice president would be for Richard Nixon. And this is the National Security Council profile in reverse. First of all, he's proved himself with the CIA. He works with the CIA. In order to work on the Warren Commission, you had to be a member of the CIA. I have copies of the minutes of the meetings, and the subject came up, who will we get to type up the notes, because everything was so secretive that they were doing. And they needed secretaries, and they said, well, we'll get the CIA girls. We'll use the pregnant girls, because they can't be out on the field now. So we'll use our pregnant girls to be our secretaries while we do our work. And the way the lawyers were selected for the uh, Warren Commission hearings were so secret, they're locked up for 75 years. And they were all intelligence agents uh, tied in with the National Security Council and assigned out of Muscle Shoals, Alabama, where the intelligence agency uh, sends lawyers to cover their conspiracy cases. The, uh, Gerald Ford is a member of the CIA. He has to be a member of the intelligence agency in order to work on the Warren Commission. He's an excellent propagandist. He knows the media. He knows propaganda because he came out of books. And Lee Harvey Oswald, he was the only member of the Warren Commission to write a book, a piece of fiction, a piece of junk. He wrote it with his campaign manager. As I mentioned before on last week's show, there were 38 witnesses that gave a description of Lee Harvey Oswald's personality. Because, see, this is what Gerald Ford was writing about. He wasn't writing about bullet 399 or the autopsy or the bullet direction. He's talking about Lee Harvey Oswald, the no good who, the Russian, the communist who didn't like America, who beat his wife, who had no meaningful relationships, who wouldn't have been happy on the moon, couldn't hold a job. All of these are lie, you know, all heavily connected to government agencies. Uh, the witnesses who gave this kind of testimony, all of them, 38 that gave the profile Lee Harvey Oswald. Gerald Ford attended three of the hearings. That's 35 witnesses that he was absent from to take witness testimony, and yet he wrote a book on the subject. And he didn't attend the hearings where it, it came out that Lee Harvey Oswald had radio training or electronic training or radar, or he was the equivalent of an officer, or had top security clearance and uh, was intelligent, college capability, and high IQ learned the language, while, Russian language while he was in the Marines. He had a lot of friends. The Gerald Ford version, he had no friends, but in Dallas, everyone was supplying them with money, rent, food, transportation, dental care, baby furniture, 100 dresses for his wife, cash all the time, housing, vacations. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was well financed, knew a lot of people, had a chain of command with oil operators, uh, chief of security of Convair, established families in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, we don't hear about that, anything like that, in Gerald Ford's book. So he's an excellent propagandist. He's against the civil rights and the busing, so he, he fits the Southern strategy and the, the group of Southerners that uh, Oglesby refers to as the cowboys. His attitudes on segregation and the Negro problem, civil rights, have been uh, very bad. He fits that profile. He's a consistent war hawk. In Vietnam, he, he proved he thought it belonged like a parking lot. It could have been leveled down. He wanted more bombs all the time. He accused Hubert Humphrey, the most wishy-washy person you could imagine, of prolonging the Indochina War by urging peace with North Vietnam. Hubert Humphrey, of all people, was his idea of a radical selling out America. He belongs to an intelligent network. He, that Gerald Ford was the man who called... Uh, it made the chain of command for G. Gordon Liddy to get to the Treasury Department and then to the White House. The chain of command of an intelligence agent who's going to be the chief lawyer to make the rules for the funding of the 1972 elections or the Liddy plan for kidnapping radicals or all the things that G. Gordon Liddy had that were heavily financed sitting with the Attorney General, the approval of the Attorney General. You don't get this man on the recommendation of a simple phone call from a congressman or a DA in New York. There's no way that you don't know who your agent is. G. Gordon Liddy worked with the FBI. He went to the Treasury Department, and uh, his, they knew what kind of work he was good for before he ever got into it. He was their high-powered Himmler, Goering. He was their courageous little one-man Hitler who knew how to call out his troops and rub people out. This last week, there was an article 
uh, that Jed Magruder made a statement to Gordon Liddy about getting rid of Jack Anderson. And he was on his way to kill him because he thought when you get rid of somebody, you kill him. Now, the way you kill him, Dre Gordon Liddy doesn't take a gun and shoot Jack Anderson like he shot out a light bulb in the Democratic headquarters. It isn't that simple. Uh, Richard Nixon has to decide who he wants around on that enemy list, I know for sure. And Charles Colson and Mr. Haldeman have a pretty good idea who they want. And if the farm growers in California don't like Cesar Chavez, I'm giving a figure of speech of how it can come down. And they can call Mr. Kalmbach of the Lincoln Club, which is secretly financed, and Kalmbach comes up with the money. They can decide maybe they don't want Cesar Chavez alive. They don't want a labor leader alive, just like they didn't like the Blonsky, Mr. Leblonsky, the mine leader, or Walter Reuther, who was also killed. So Mr. John Caulfield, who worked in the Treasury Department with G. Gordon Liddy, at the same time that the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms made a tape-recorded deal which can be verified to kill Cesar Chavez and Eldridge Cleaver. Men like Anthony Lasowitz meet Mr. Caulfield. Similar to the New York Territory, we have the Minutemen and Nazis surrounding the farm growers in California. They're used at this end, and you kill Cesar Chavez. The reason he's alive today is that Larry Shears disclosed down in L.A. on KPFA or KPFK, the conversation with alcohol, tobacco, and firearm to kill Cesar Chavez. He broke the tra chain of command from the Treasury Department. But that's the way it goes out. That's how the labor leaders are killed. And when you say you want to rub out, Mr. Liddy's in the Treasury Department. He was there just about that time. And this is the way it goes. But you don't give this kind of an assignment to a man like G. Gordon Liddy unless you know what he's capable of doing, and he has a special role in the operation. So when Gerald Ford was responsible for Liddy's appointment into the Treasury Department, and when you think of his work on the Warren Commission, you realize how heavily he is involved in espionage, not only his opinions about the war or civil rights, but in the hardcore espionage. Gerald Ford was considered honest. The appraisal of the congressman is good. We have an honest man. It seems we're having so many crooks in Washington. Uh, his one reputation, his big thing, is his honesty. Well, John Mitchell was honest until McCord started talking, and Agnew was honest until he was called a crook, and Marie Stans was honest until uh, they found about his safe with all the secret money flowing around, and Richard Nixon was honest until the Watergate story really broke. A lot of people didn't think he was, but they still voted for him and made him a president, thinking he was honest enough. Gerald Ford is, is another qualification. He's a good team player, the news said. Well, that's for sure. He's a good team player, and the, the person who backs him up the most is his wife, and he fits another classification of this particular administration. His dear wife tells how they were married in October 48, and they had to get married on Friday so Jerry could get to a football game on Saturday. And after the game, they went up to Michigan to hear Thomas Dewey give a political speech, and then their honeymoon began at 4 o'clock, a.m. the next day. So he's a good team player. He's right with the politicians, and he's right with the football team, and therefore he might make a really good president of the United States, like Haldeman and Ehrlichman and all the other team players. He's a man who wants to pour money into domestic uh, programs, a minimal amount of money into domestic programs, and he always pushed the weapons system and the space system. I have a catalog at home of his various ventures, and fundings and both in warfare machinery. The most outrageous is in April 72 when the controversial space shuttle funding was going on. NASA wanted five, five point one five billion dollars over six years. And they said it would go to $35 billion for a six-year space shuttle. And Majority Leader Hill Boggs, also of the Warren Commission, and Gerald Ford of the Warren Commission called this shuttle vital to the future of America's space program. Our priorities are so confused that what is vital to the space is contracts, again, to Howard Hughes, who puts this man in the White House, to the ITT, the communication satellites, the corporations that can overthrow Chile and, and take uh, kill Allende and keep countries in the form of military dictatorships. The satellites are being used for that, and they're being used for many more oppressive, frightening things. I'm going to do a program maybe in a week or two on the oppressions being put down by the satellites, the space satellites. So nothing in a pressure for domestic funding. They, 
at the time that he wanted the $35 billion for space. There was no suggestion of building up Washington, D.C. that were burnt down at the time of the riots of Martin Luther King or the depressed poverty areas of the slums of Detroit, New York, Newark, New Jersey, all over the United States. Uh, there was an article this week about gang warfare in Chinatown, these young boys killing each other in San Francisco. There's gang warfare in Boston. No domestic programs for these youth. No sufficient trade schools or occupations for them to get into. Nothing to look forward to. No contracts in the space agency. They're white racists. They're run by white races. The minorities don't work for them, even if they wanted to. And Gerald Ford fits the profile. So as the new vice president of Richard Nixon had his way, we'd have a member from the Central Intelligence Agency on the war from the Warren Commission, a propagandist with a book that's fictitious, a man against civil rights, a consistent war hawk at a time we want peace, a man who brought G. Gordon Liddy to the White House to the committee to reelect the president. And I didn't go into his secret fundings that's been on the radio and in the news. His cash fundings, fundings that weren't accounted for, his jailed for committee um, that is written up in the book Washington Payoff, his secret funds, his uh, good team playing, and his intent to put money into warfare machinery and ignore the domestic needs. Now, if you want to send wire to impeach Richard Nixon, you might add a PS, get rid of Gerald Ford. We don't want him. We don't need him. It's more of the same. The problems in the country are so great, and we tend to zoom on one thing, like let's uh, get rid of Richard Nixon. But in the meantime, all of his appointments in the last year uh, are taking over control of the government. So if Nixon goes out, uh, these people remain. Now, uh, this week, Dialogue Conspiracy, you know, the format is to take the news of the week as it pertains to the past political assassinations and two other murders relating to them come in the news this week. Uh, this last week, the subject came out of James Earl Ray. Uh, his attorney, you'll recognize the name, it's Bernard Fensterwald. He's a friend of mine. He's James Ray's lawyer. He's James McCord's lawyer. Uh, there's a, a court appearance for... Uh, Earl, James Earl Ray, to overturn the 99-year sentence in Nashville, Tennessee. He said that his former attorney, Percy, Percy Foreman, coerced him into pleading guilty April the 4th, 1969, in exchange for prison sentence. And Ray now wants to plead not guilty. Mr. Bernard Fensterwald said Mr. Foreman's behavior in this case was outrageous. He talked to no witnesses. He made no investigation of the case. He told Ray that there was a 100% chance of a conviction and a 99% chance he'd go to the electric chair if he didn't plead guilty. And Percy Foreman was sent in without finding out if James Ray was innocent. He was forced to plead guilty. Before Ray entered his plea, he was browbeaten and he was bribed and he was badgered. This is in a hearing in Cincinnati that's been presented by Bernard Fenceroll. Ray was to pay Percy Foreman for his legal work through a book by William Bradford Ewey on the death of Martin Luther King. But Mr. Fensterwald has said that when Mr. Foreman agreed, when he got James Ray to agree to say that he was guilty and take that sentence and not bring his evidence of innocence before the court, he wouldn't have to give him the initial fee of 165000 Percy Foreman came into the case and said, you're going to be barbecued. Those are the words he used. You're going to be barbecued. You'll be roasted. Give me a fee. 165000 and you can plead initial fee, and, and he entered a plea of guilty. And because James Ray was such a good man, a good boy, he gave back the money. There was no money transacted. But Bernard Fenserwald has asked the court to release Ray from his cell to prepare his case for a new trial or a hearing. Ray wants a new trial. He wants to undo the ballistics test. He wants to get witnesses, and he wants to prove that he did not kill Martin Luther King. Now, that isn't shocking enough. The new movie that we mentioned last week, I think I mentioned briefly, The Second Gun, opened up at the Translux Theater in New York City and also in Boston. Time magazine this week, dated October the 22nd, has an article on The Second Gun. Now, here is investigative work done by a private individual for Sirhan Sirhan to prove that he didn't kill Robert Kennedy. If we're talking now about a situation in Washington, D.C., where the whole nation is stirred up about a few tapes. And we have to get our minds more geared to the subject which I have been 
documenting these past years on the really horrendous subject of if Sirhan didn't kill Robert Kennedy and private investigators have spent five years looking up the evidence, now making a movie, a professional movie, a widescreen movie that's out there for you to see, and nobody's mentioning that in the headlines. They're talking about a few rotten tapes in the White House about whether or not the president knew ahead of time about the Watergate or was part of the cover-up. But it is horrendous. And not making the headlines, if you look at the priorities, is the implication that the attorney general in California, Evelyn Younger, was involved in the cover-up of the assassination of Robert Kennedy. And this involved the, the fact that Richard Nixon became president in the first place. And it goes back to that financing of Howard Hughes in 67 that a million dollars will buy the president. And then in 68, he began to dole out a lot of money because he had a candidate that he could get in to represent his interests this time. He gave 50000 cash to Hubert Humphrey also. So the movie now is in New York City, and Time Magazine gives it. It's under the law section, not the movie section. And it's quite a long article called A Second Sirhan. It goes into the eight eyewitnesses that saw the shooting and the autopsy report and the maitre d' at the Ambassador Hotel, who ushered in Kennedy and saw Sirhan in front of him, and how the autopsy shows that Sirhan was killed with a bullet wound one inch from the back of the head, one half inches from the back of the head. And it mentions the security guard, Thane Eugene Caesar, who was behind Kennedy, and drew a gun, a .22 revolver, and that the security guard fired back that night. The gun did, in fact, go off. And it goes into the ballistic evidence of William Harper. Now, they go into the subject, Time Magazine of the Second Gun, uh, but there's no front page headlines about what this means, the implications, if Sirhan wasn't the assassin, or the alleged assassin is out on the streets. Next week, I'm going into the game plan that was described by Daniel Del Solar, who used to be at Harvard University. We're going into the game plan called Politica, the overthrow of Chile that was planned in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we're going into the game plan of Camelot, also done in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which seemed to be the 10-year erasing of what John Kennedy had begun to achieve or hoped to achieve in terms of peace, civil rights, and democracy. And what you're seeing in Washington now with the Fuhrer calling in the marshals and calling off the investigation of himself is just about the end of the game plan of Camelot. And Richard Nixon can do anything he wants is weak and tell you, I'll ignore your telegrams, your investigations, and your impeachment. He has the power to do it if he wants to do it. So we'll meet next week, and we'll see where we are at that point. But don't underestimate the power of the people that put Richard Nixon in pres as president. He is kept there by large, well-armed military people, and they can't move out because a list of signatures told them to move out. Well, that's it for today, and we'll meet next Monday in Dialogue Conspiracy.